Hello guys, it's Eric with the Film Photography Channel. Today we're going to look at the Minolta SRT-102. As the name would suggest, the SR stands for Single Lens Reflex. The T in the nomenclature stands for Through the Lens or TTL Metering. And the 102 in this case just happens to be the, the top of the line uh, model with all the bells and whistles that Minolta offered for this camera. Now that being said, it's a really basic camera. It, it doesn't have a lot of like the fancy buttons and, and the oversized dials that you saw like in the later you know, uh, 1980s and 90s era cameras. It's just a classic metal body, absolutely beautiful, uh, manual focus, um, manual exposure, completely mechanical camera. This camera doesn't require a battery for anything other than the uh, meter. It's completely mechanical and it'll work without the battery. You just won't have metering. Now, speaking of the metering, this camera has what's called the uh, CLC, the Contrast Light Compensation Metering System. It's a really smart system that Minolta came up with. Although it predated matrix metering as such, it used multiple cells in order to come up with a good average of the scene that you're, that you're photographing. And the way it did that was not through complex circuitry or anything. It just did it with two very simple cells, one near the front of the pentaprism, and the other one mounted near the rear of the pentaprism, you know, on the inside there. And what uh, they would do is the bottom cell would give priority, an extra stop of priority to the foreground and to the bottom half of your picture frame where the other cell would take a normal reading of the sky. So given that the bottom cell has an extra stop of priority, it, the system would not let a bright point or the bright sky over you know, overcome the the meter reading that the camera was taking. And it wasn't like a complex system that used circuitry or what whatnot to, to, you know, to actively read everything. It just simply said, bottom half, you get an extra stop, top half, normal reading. The, the two are, and they kind of intersected in the middle also, the two, the areas that the two cells read. So in practice, you have a really effective, kind of like matrix metering system. I mean, it, it's a simple one-trick pony. I mean, you can call it a, a plow horse. It only knows how to do one thing. It just surveys the scene and says, okay, this is how I meter the top half no matter what, and this is how I meter the bottom half no matter what. You get an extra stop of, you know, of, uh, of goodness there in order to come up with an evenly metered scene, and it works. It has a nice uh, sized and, and a pretty good feeling a film advance lever. Now I've seen a lot of these cameras with the plastic that is broken off of them so apparently that's a thing uh, with this model which is a shame because it's, it's a otherwise really well engineered model but if you look at the back of it here you kind of see the plastic uh, grip there is just kind of stamped to the metal. If, if it comes off and you don't lose it then I'm sure crazy glue would be would do the job I don't think Crazy Glue actually even existed when this camera came out. So you see the serial number there and the uh, film counter window. Nice oversized film counter window, black background uh, with silverish letters, which makes it really, really easy to, to view like in the bright sunlight or, or just about in any conditions. So that's good. I, I do like a film counter window that you can actually see. Uh, looking at the front of the camera, again, just absolutely beautiful lines. I like the, the extra creases that Minolta put here in the, in the prism. Kind of gives it a nice look. The, uh, the index to, to mount your lens right there, it's, it's really nice. Um, this is the, the lens mounting or the, the lens release lever or switch right there. It just kind of slides down and you can uh, release the lens once you rotate it there. Uh, SRT-102 engraved on the front just absolutely beautiful and if you look closely you can see a little window here that lets you see in the case of this camera it lets you see the uh, the aperture setting inside the viewfinder which is cool 
All right, uh, CLC for contract, contrast light compensation emblazoned on the front there. And if you look at the, the lens is, is linking up here with this uh, aperture index uh, ring here, which what that does is that lets the camera know which aperture you're using. All right, so this is literally the first camera, or not the 102, but the SRT line, were the first cameras to actually let uh, the user use the camera at uh, at full f-stop. Okay, before uh, the SRT line, the the cameras, uh, the f-stop on the cameras would always shut down. Let me get that here. It would always shut down as you were setting your exposure. Not with the SRT line. The SRT line was the first line to let you go full aperture, and the this this little linkage here would let the camera body know what f-stop the lens is using. So that was like pretty great, you know, breaking technology back in those days. And Minolta did it first. The self timer is just like a beast here. It's just this really heavy, very mechanical, very well built. Feels like it'll last forever uh, type of uh, lever there and of course it's going to be nice and loud it's probably around 10 seconds which is pretty typical uh, of the day and you can see the the, the uh, shutter going down the self timer pulls it down as it actuates this here is your depth of field preview and given what i just said about the uh, the lens you know the indexing deal it's a it's a pretty the the depth of field preview was a huge deal you know because some people you know are are still used to using the the old fashioned way where the lens was was stopping down as you turn the aperture ring so if you wanted to use it that way you could still do that um, and this of course would show you the depth of field as you could tell it doesn't actuate unless the the shutter is cocked so once you once you press that in once the shutter is cocked you press it in and then it it'll actually start working um, a little tidbit for you the the meter is turned off when this button is pressed in and the only way you can really tell that if the button is pressed in is by rotating this because it, it kind of stays at the same position whether it's actuated or not it doesn't really change no big deal though but um, uh, one little side note though this this is a quick way to turn your meter off uh, if you know if you're just not using a camera because the other way to turn the meter off is this switch oddly placed at the bottom here of the camera which takes a little bit of effort um, when you rotate it and as you can see there's there's the on and off uh, positions and the BC is not backlight compensation it is battery check and if you look inside the uh, the window you're gonna see uh, a little a little tab that if you if you have a good battery you rotate this to the to the BC position and then the needle should inside there should jump to that to that tab to indicate that you've got a good battery um, but anyway um, like I said when you have this pressed in then that's a, just a quick way to turn the quick way to turn the meter off if you don't want to go through you know like losing your fingerprints potentially and uh, maybe like leaving a, a DNA sample here on the bottom of your camera so you know just just a quick tip there uh, tripod socket lined up as it should be you know in line with the with the lens and of course your this is where you put your, your 625 battery uh, if you if you look in Amazon I'll, and I'll leave a link you can get a wine w-e-i-n 625 which gives you the correct voltage as the old school. The Mercury batteries aren't uh, aren't around anymore, so the, these wine people, they actually make uh, the appropriate voltage battery for this camera. Uh, and then of course your push button there just to uh, re release the film. Your film, re film rewind release button is what I'm trying to say. All right, let's look around some more. One little tidbit here. This is your mirror lockup. Okay, it looks like something straight out of the Olympus parts bin. And anybody who's owned an Olympus camera will know exactly what I'm talking about, an Olympus film camera. 
as we actuate that, you can see there's your mirror lock up. But let's go ahead and take the lens off uh, so you can get a look at what's happening there. See, mirror's up out of the way. And that, of course, reduces vibration as needed for long exposure photos or for anything else where, where you know, the reduction of vibration is would be important. The SRT series is a system camera, and while it didn't have any type of motor drive, there was actually one model, I, I want to say it was the SRM, that had an inbuilt motor drive that it wasn't removable. That was the only one with, a, with a, any type of uh, automated film advance. The rest of them were just like this, where you just, you know, just go manually to, to advance the film. The lenses were from 7.5 millimeter fisheye all the way up to a 1600 millimeter telephoto lens. So that's a, a really, really thorough uh, line of uh, lenses for, the, for this uh, mount camera. And they are absolutely wonderful lenses too. This early model Minolta 7.5 millimeter fisheye lens required that the camera actually have the mirror locked up in order just to mount the lens. As you can see, the rear element protrudes so far into the camera well that uh, you would damage the mirror if it wasn't locked up out of the way. It also came with an external viewfinder, which was necessary for framing the photo. But later models of the 7.5 millimeter didn't have this problem. I have a, a 50 millimeter 1.7 that came with it. You know, it was already just on the camera when I bought it, uh, and it is a an absolutely fine lens. It's it's super sharp, great bokeh, great color. I mean, just a really nice lens. But that being said, the 1.4 has a reputation um, for being that lens, the lens that you want to get uh, with this camera. And if it, if it weren't for the fact that I just you know they the person who sold it to me. They just wanted to sell the whole thing, you know, so fine. But I, I can say that I've been really happy with uh, the results from this uh, 50 millimeter 1.7. Uh, no issues there at all. So let's take a quick look inside the camera here. It's pretty typical. You just pull up on the uh, uh, film rewind knob and that releases the back. And you can see the cloth curtain shutter, which is pretty typical for cameras that max out at one one thousandth of a second. And remember, this is a 70s era camera. So the metal shutters, I think, came a little bit later. It's got an easy loading uh, system there. Uh, it just it just works well. It's not like one of the fancy quick load systems that, that does it for you, but it, it does just fine. Uh, nice clean lines. Uh, everything looks good back there. This is not a removable film back. It's just a regular film back. If you look through here, this is what we're calling the, the uh, tongue and groove, uh, where the film back has like a little lip, or I guess the tongue, and it fits inside this groove here to give you a good seal. Really nice engineered camera. The viewfinder is absolutely gorgeous. It is big. It's not the biggest, like say an Olympus OM-1 or the Pentax ME actually has a really big viewfinder. And, and other cameras that came a little bit later, that that became more of a of a deal, of, you know, of a big deal in marketing to get that viewfinder really big. This viewfinder is big, certainly big enough. Uh, it's about the size of a full frame SLR or DSLR um, that you would uh, see nowadays. It's just a hair smaller than some of those other ones that I mentioned. But one thing that makes this stand out is that. It is a really, really clear viewfinder. It's It's got high quality glass in there. And the significance of that is that you can use just about any part of this viewfinder to attain focus. It's unlike anything I've seen in any other camera. Um, I, I don't know exactly how Minolta did it. Between the focusing screen and the ground glass uh, that's in here in, in the uh, inside the viewfinder, they did something to make this an exceptional uh, camera to for manual focusing uh, again unlike anything else that I've seen this one comes with a split prism in the middle on the focusing screen and then the the ground glass around it you know the collar some of the uh, other lower models didn't have the split prism they only had the the ground glass uh, ring but in this one this is the first camera that I that just makes it so clear that I've used anyway 
that makes it so clear when something is in focus because that ring that we're all used to seeing if we've been using SLRs for a while, that little ring in the middle of the, of the camera just goes absolutely clear when the subject is in focus. I mean, absolutely clear. It's, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. It just gives you the feeling that you're really using a, a really, really um, well-made, high-quality piece of equipment. Um, and that, I was immediately impressed with that. I mean, that's something you can see. And, and the focusing screen itself is just nice. And actually, it is a little, it is pretty big. I can uh, view it with my glasses without any problem. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's amazing to me how how quickly or how clearly that ring just disappears. You see all the little diamond the little diamond pattern in the ring, and then the ring just goes absolutely clear when your subject is in focus. And of course, the the split prism does its uh, job as well. But in addition to all that, you can you can absolutely tell just by using the the matte part of it, not not the ring, not the split image. But just the focusing ring itself, I mean, I'm sorry, the focusing screen itself, you can very clearly tell when something is in focus without using any of the, the center-mounted focusing aids, just the screen itself. I found that to be just really, really exceptional um, and impressive. Okay, so all that being said, oh, last thing I'll mention here for the body, where are we? Uh, you see the, the uh, ISO in the middle there just pretty typical of a lot of these cameras you just kind of pull up on the ring to uh, let's see if i can get you to see it there pull up on the ring to change your iso and the iso range on this camera is from 6 to 6400 which is also uh, pretty impressive especially for a camera that we're talking in the 70s not the 80s so that just tells you when when the iso range is that wide and when it actually goes that low down to six that tells you it's a really good meter. It's a sensitive meter that's in there, which is it's more important for low light photography than it would be for you know daylight. But just the fact that the range is that wide, it just tells you it's it's a good meter, and it is. It, it I, I had uh, I've gotten nothing but perfect perfectly metered photos from this camera. Now, all that being said, this is a little this guy's a little bit heavy. Okay, I'm feeling it. I'm picking it up here. It's it's definitely a, on the heavy side. It's heavier than just about every other film SLR that I've got and that I've used in the past. I'm not sure why it's as heavy as it is. Maybe there's you know the in the in uh, parts of it or the internals uh, are brass or something, or they use some you know brass under the top plate. I don't know, but it's it's definitely on the heavy side. It's heavier than an F3. It's heavier than any uh, of the FM series cameras or FE series cameras that I've used. Definitely heavier than a, like an Olympus OM-1 or uh, any of those uh, SLR cameras. Um, and that's a little bit of a downside, but if you're if you're wearing it around your neck, or I use a, a sling that kind of goes across the body and is rest at my waist uh, or at my hip, you know, that takes away, because that's the same system I use for the, um, for the F6, my Nikon F6, which is also a heavier camera you know kind of like around the maybe a little heavier than this or about the same as this um but that that definitely helps offset any of that the the weight that you may be feeling over here on the other side again still rating the old olympus parts bin uh we have the fp which stands for focal plane slash x uh sync and so fp is for the the old bulbs which we don't use anymore and x is for the uh, just a regular modern flash like we if you want to have a flash off camera you can just plug it right in there um, and and use uh, X sync I mentioned earlier that this is the SRT camera that has all the stuff right all everything just about that Minolta offered on this line of cameras uh, it does not have the film holder it's got this conversion chart from ASA to DIN uh, I don't know why they didn't put the film holder on there but it does have the uh, inside the viewfinder. It has the shutter speed along the bottom of the frame. Along the bottom, you'll see the shutter speed on uh, on one side. I think I guess it would be on this side as I'm looking at it. Uh, you'll see your your metering needles. It's and it's a match needle system. So you've got one needle with a circle at the end. You've got another needle that's just a straight needle. The straight needle is the one that moves with the light, 
and then the circle, the, the, the needle with the circle at the end is the one that you match to the light, okay? So as that straight needle moves, you, uh, you manipulate the, uh, the um, f-stop here, the aperture ring, or the, the shutter speed dial, and these, both of these rings will, will uh, move that needle with the circle at the end, and, and they call it match needle, why? Because you're, you're trying to match that circle needle to the straight needle. Once you get those two in sync, then you've got proper exposure. And probably a long explanation for a, a simple system, but that's how match needle works. And I'm not crazy about match needle. It's okay. You get used to it. Uh, I much like, uh, much prefer like um, something like on the K1000, where you just have like a you know a bracket with a little gap in the middle, and, and the needle just moves until you get it in the center of that bracket. That, I find it much easier, much more intuitive. This works. You can get used to it. Not a huge deal, but just not the best you know, system in, in my opinion. And also inside the viewfinder, you'll see a, um, uh, remember I mentioned the little window here, you'll see the f-stop display on the top. So you've got shutter speeds on the bottom, f-stop on the top, and then you've got your your uh, needle array on the right side as you're looking through the viewfinder that you use to, to establish, you know, a properly exposed uh, photo. So yeah, but a uh, great system overall. I mentioned also earlier that it is a uh, mechanical, completely mechanical camera. And just a little tidbit here, so you can, when a way to know that a camera is fully me mechanical is by doing. All right. Mechanical cameras use like clockwork, like little gears to to establish their time. Uh, you know, like the time, like the one second, one half second where cameras that, that use electronics for their slower, for all their shutter speeds, um, they use like quartz or, or some other type. It's still kind of like a watch uh, assembly in there, but it just doesn't make any noise. Where these manual cameras, uh, or mechanical cameras, I should say, they all, you'll always hear that. In use, in practical use, this is a camera, you can pick it up. Again, the focusing is an absolute delight. You know when you're in focus. It's just really, really reassuring and and really fast. So any any of like the misgivings that I might have with that match needle system that I'm not crazy about, and that's again just a personal thing with me, personal uh, preference or whatever. Um, but it, it's more than made up by that beautiful focusing system that this camera has. It is just absolutely uh, phenomenal. Can't say enough about it. I, but I probably have said enough about it at this point. So when you go to rewind the, the film that, that's in the camera there, um, of course, pretty standard stuff. You hit the, the film rewind release lever, and then you pop out the, the dial here. But uh, what I want to point out here, so now I'm actively able to rewind the film, but if my finger were to slip off, and I love this feature on this camera, not a lot of cameras have it, finger slips off, you see it doesn't ratchet back into the film can. Like the film can uh, doesn't pull the this this uh, lever back. It just maintains its position. And you see that? That's just great engineering. I just love that. Double exposures are possible with this camera. It's it's a very simple process, but then it's, it's a little weird too. And I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about, okay? So the, the method to carry out a, a multiple exposure, I should say, not just double, you can do as many as you like, is to uh, hit the, um, the uh, film rewind release button right there, All right? And I'll just show you, before I do that, show you what it looks like. This is a normal film advance, of course. The gears are moving in there. Now, if I were to do the multiple exposure, you take a photo, right and you press that in and you'll notice that the film is not advancing you can take another photo if you only want to do one multiple and it's back to normal but uh, otherwise you can do this basically all day keep hitting the button and 
multiple exposures all day long. Now, the weird part about this is that um, if you look at the, where is it? If you look at the, the film counter window, take the photo, hit the button. Now watch the film counter window. Hit the button, take the photo, film counter window is advancing, which is weird. You know, it, the film counter window continues to advance when you're still taking, the, you know, a photo of the same frame. So I guess there was no way to work around that. So just, just to know, that's why I showed you with the back open, so you can confirm that the film is not advancing, even though the film counter is still advancing. When you start digging a little bit under the skin of this camera, you start finding all these nice little tidbits of it on this camera. And they're not uh, features that you'll find it's more quality that you'll find this the camera is just so well made i mean everything just works perfectly and that that can be said about a lot of cameras of the film era but this camera i think just takes it a, a step uh further in as much as everything in here is just made so well it's just so well made that um you know it just stood out to me i, I thought I, that that should be the theme of this video it's like just how well made this camera is and how well it does everything doesn't have a ton of features it's got you know pretty normal shutter speeds one to one one thousandth of a second and on and on no motor drive you know none of those crazy film backs it doesn't have a removal film back or any of that stuff it's just your basic uh camera that that you know it's just one of these cameras that just would last forever that'll never let you down that uh, it's a little on the heavy side and just does what it does extremely, extremely well. This is one of the most popular or, or most used cameras from the Vietnam War. Uh, if that says anything, it's you know would be perfect for those you know terrible conditions uh, when that was going on. You know, you, you take it over there. You've got heat. You got uh, you got rain. You got all these horrible conditions, and you know cameras, of course. And those type of conditions will get pounded around all over the place. This is a camera that you can pound it around, and you know, it, you just it'll just keep on going. Inside the uh, the viewfinder, this camera has a double hinged, oversized mirror, not just for the, you know, for the use of these uh, telephoto or wide angle lenses that may be subject to vignetting, but also to minimize mirror slap. Now, um, I don't know how much you can really tell because it is kind of close to the microphone but it's just got such a well dampened uh, and well um, or just a great quality feel as you're tripping the shutter and taking pictures with this camera the shutter button is absolutely perfect doesn't surprise you you know exactly when it's gonna go off it's just the right size of course there's a cable release for the standard cables you know, cable releases of uh, uh, the old metal ones. Um, and again, just mechanical perfection, the way the, the shutter is. I compare this uh, in terms of price to like a K1000 or something like that from Pentax or other cameras um, that are on the cheaper side in terms of price. This um, mirror and the whole shutter actuation is much quieter, much smoother than a K1000. So that you can probably get them for around the same price. This may even come in a little cheaper. Both cameras have great, great uh, glass. Uh, Minolta Rocker glass is absolutely lovely. I mean, it's, again, like I mentioned on this 50 millimeter 1.7, sharp, contrasty, um, just just absolutely wonderful. It, it's And that's been true of every Minolta camera that I've got. So the Roker nomenclature on the lens, as you can see right there, it came from the Minolta founder. And let me get his name right. It was Kazuo, Kazuo Tashimi, the founder of Minolta. He named it after Mount Rocco, R-O-K-K-O. And I guess, you know, something that he's fond of. And he just named it after that. And, and the, the Roker lens lenses were born. So if you look at the the lens, the ring here of this lens, you'll see the 50 millimeter 1.7 and all that. But you'll also see here, it's a Roker PF lens. And the, the PF is a code. The first letter stands for the number of groups. The second letter stands for the number of elements. Now it's not like uh, 
uh, Olympus does where the letter corresponds, like the number where, where the letter falls in the alphabet corresponds with that number. So the P stands for five groups and the F stands for six elements. So this is six elements in five groups. The Minolta SR series of lenses, which are the ones that fit the SR uh, T series of cameras, came in a few different variants. The pre-MC are the ones that didn't have the meter coupling. Uh, they were produced from 1958 to 1969 or 70. And the early MC uh, Roker lenses produced from 1966 to 1972. That was the first generation with the meter coupling that actually allowed the camera to meter with the aperture wide open. These can be identified by the silver unpainted aperture ring at the base of the camera. The later MC lenses, uh, known as the typical MC Roker lenses, produced from 1972 to 75, 76, and the same version but a little bit later models uh, produced from 76, 77. Those are the second and third generation. Those had the black aperture dial and the knobby uh, focusing dial where the previous generation had like a metal knurled dial for focusing the, the first MC lenses. And the MD Roker lenses produced from 1977 to 1979, those are the lenses that worked with the uh, Minolta XD series bodies. This series of lenses was compatible with the XD series of bodies that worked with either program or shutter priority modes. This is a, a Rocker X 100mm f2.5 lens. This little lens is an absolute gem of a lens. Okay, full stop. It is sharp, it is contrasty, it is a wonderful, wonderful portrait lens. When I buy a camera, I'll, I'll get like a standard lens, maybe a zoom, if they made zooms for it, and, uh, and a wide angle. And this time I thought I'd do a, a telephoto and I started doing a little research and there was a lot of talk about this lens. It's just like a wonderful little portrait lens, you know, a medium telephoto type of lens. Or I guess it would be considered a short telephoto type of lens. But um, cannot recommend this one enough. I mean, and I'll, I'll show you another thing here that uh, one of the things I noticed with both of the uh, MC lenses that I've got, if you turn the focus ring on both of these lenses, I mean, they are silky, silky smooth. They're very well weighted. But one thing that really stood out to me going back to how finely these uh, camera, these cameras and lenses are engineered. One thing that really stood out was how, how smooth this is throughout the lens travel. It's the same for the, um, same thing for the 50 mil, um, this 50 millimeter 1.7. I mean, it's, it's the focus travel has no uh, rough spots, no, no uh, hard spots like, Almost every lens I've ever used, probably except for maybe Zeiss and uh, and Leica, the the lenses always have a little spot. It's, it's, sometimes it's not terrible, but sometimes it has just this little spot where it it's just a little harder to turn than uh, than like when you start turning. And this lens, I'm telling you, it's, it's hard to really communicate that on video, but it is silky smooth throughout the focus travel. There is just no rough spots, and that's true of both of these lenses. All that being said, it's a really nice camera. Uh, the, the only downside for me, literally, is just a little bit of weight. I mentioned it more than once, so you guys are probably getting the, the hint by now. This camera's a little bit on the heavyish side. Not a huge deal if, you're, if you've got the proper equipment to hold it with, but just a consideration. Um, it's an absolutely gorgeous camera. I mean, I, I really grew to like it a lot very quickly. I bought a, a couple of these uh, cameras a, a few years ago. I bought uh, an SRT 101, I think it was, and another one, I think it was a 202 or something like that. The second one had this weird problem that, if I can explain it, okay, if you look here in the, uh, the film, the take-up spool, which we all know is right here, as as I advance the film in that particular camera, what would happen on the take up side is the film was not being drawn tightly. 
the film was was being uh, wound into this spool very loosely. So what happened is that the 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 film that's being uh, on the Intex side became very very you know big. Okay, it became so big because it's not being wound tightly to the point where it would prevent these uh, these teeth here from catching in the sprocket holes of the 35 millimeter film. And conversely, it, it just stopped advancing. You know, after about the sixth, seventh, maybe, yeah, seven or eighth frame, something like that, um, this was so big here that it just it forced the film to skip over and it just stopped advancing altogether. It was a weird problem. And again, this was like a, a few years ago, like probably at least three years, and it turned me off to this camera. The fact that I bought two of them and they were they both had issues and, and again, you buy from eBay, always make sure the seller is reputable and has a return policy. I returned both cameras, no harm done, except for the fact that I was turned off uh, to these uh, SRT line of cameras, which is a really wonderful camera. Uh, but I was turned off be because of those uh, the issues I had with those two. Uh, I'm glad that I ran into this at my local Photoshop, and the. You know, it, it was just sitting there. It was minty. I mean, there, there's literally no blemishes or scratches except for this one little guy right there. Is the only one I could find, and I may have done that myself. I hope I didn't. But uh, overall, I mean, it is absolutely pristine. It is just a a beautiful camera. Uh, it's it's a fun camera to use. It's an easy camera to use. Pick it up, put it to your eye. You're you're ready to go. You got that perfect focusing. You got that that fairly easy to to use match needle system once you once you get used to it, it takes a little you know it takes a little getting used to but once you get used to it, you can be really effective in terms of taking the photos hope you all got some uh, good information here i really do like this camera it's fun to use it's easy to use very intuitive it gets out of your way and lets you take great photos and uh, the glass that you can get is not just a really good variety but it's exceptional glass Go get the Minolta SRT 102.